number 13, Shandon Scott. By the time he turned 31 years old, Terence Trent Voss had a rap sheet spanning more than half his life. As a long-standing member of Salt Lake City's Black Mafia gangster street gang, his prior convictions consisted of drive-by shootings, aggravated assaults, robberies, weapons charges, witness tampering, and more. Consequently, Voss spent his adolescent and adult years in and out of prison. In 2020, he was granted compassionate release, which is typically given to terminally ill prisoners, but was extended to Voss following his daughter's murder. But just weeks later, he was caught driving under the influence and was sent back to prison to continue serving his original sentence. During a parole hearing two months later, Voss blamed his decision to drive intoxicated on the stress and grief he was experiencing after losing his daughter. According to court documents, he insisted that he didn't act out of a deliberate disrespect for the law. The parole board sympathized with Voss, and by then, the COVID-19 pandemic was plaguing America's prisons. So, once again, he was released early. Voss failed to comply with the terms of his parole, though, which included an in-person visit at least once every two months. Parole officers made multiple failed attempts to visit Voss's home. On one occasion, nobody answered the door, even though his ankle monitor showed that he was inside. Another time, the officers noticed bullet holes in the siding of Voss's house. Voss also waited several weeks to report a police encounter to his parole officer, which parolees in Utah are required to do within 48 hours, even when no arrests are made. Given his violent history, the accumulation of red flags was troubling, yet the probation and parole department continuously failed to treat the situation with urgency. Then, in January 2021, Voss's girlfriend Shandon Scott reported him to the police for assaulting her. She was visibly injured and scared, and said that she was worried Voss would hurt her family. Scott further claimed that Voss had broken her legs months earlier, but that she didn't report him because she was afraid he would kill her. By the time a warrant was issued for Voss's arrest, the GPS on his ankle monitor had stopped working and he was nowhere to be found. During his several months on the run, Scott was found dead in a car with multiple gunshot wounds along a highway. According to authorities, Voss shot his girlfriend, then deliberately crashed the car before fleeing on foot. As a result, he was charged with aggravated murder and will hopefully remain behind bars this time. But as of now, the case is ongoing. Number 12, Brianna Kinnear. Carol Kinnear from Canada didn't tiptoe around things when it came to her disapproval of her 21-year-old daughter's gangster boyfriend, Jesse Marguson. Brianna Kinnear had received a conditional sentence for a drug trafficking charge, which gave her an opportunity to clean up her record by staying out of trouble. But Brianna continued to date Jesse, and by early 2009, Carol was at her wit's end with the situation. After trying to be patient, the concerned mother mentioned in a text message to her daughter that maybe some tough love was in order. Carol later told the Vancouver Sun that she would have never disowned Brianna, but that she was considering taking a more hard line approach to her daughter's wayward relationship. Sadly, just hours after the conversation, Brianna was shot to death outside Vancouver, British Columbia, in the city of Coquitlam. She was with Jesse at the time and was driving a vehicle owned by another young woman named Tiffany Bryan. Police initially weren't sure which one of the three were the intended target of the gunfire, but they speculated that the incident may have been connected to three other shooting deaths that happened over a year-long span beginning in early 2008. Police sources told CBC News that the four victims were connected with Jesse Marguson and another gangster named Troy Dax McKinnon. They were all allegedly street-level drug dealers who often worked with or for gangs, but weren't fully fledged members themselves. Speaking with the Vancouver Sun the following year, Carol Kinnear said that Brianna thought dating a gangster made her immune to violence, but in reality, it was most likely what led to her death. According to police corporal Dale Carr, drug dealers who worked at the group's level could land in bad situations if they failed to pay back their higher-ups for lost product. One of the victims had told a relative the night before his death that he had lost money he owed to someone and that he was in trouble. For Carol Kinnear, Brianna's death was a warning to other young women about the dangers of dating gangsters and a false sense of security that often comes along with it. For the cops, the four murders spoke to the risks of getting involved with the illegal drug trade. 
Brianna's murder remains unsolved to this day. For at least a decade afterward, Carol put an annual notice in the local newspaper on the anniversary of her daughter's death, urging anyone with information to come forward to law enforcement. But unfortunately, it's still unclear whether Brianna was the target of the shooting or if she simply got caught in the crosshairs of gang violence. Number 11. Haley Grisham LAPD officer Fernando Arroyos had a promising future to look forward to. He began his law enforcement career in 2019 after graduating with honors from UC Berkeley and started saving to buy a home right away. Three years later in early 2022, he and his girlfriend began house hunting. While out looking at homes one afternoon, the couple stopped to take some pictures of a property that was for sale. But then out of nowhere a pickup truck pulled up to the pair. Four individuals spilled out of the vehicle and attempted to rob them. Arroyos tried to defend himself and his girlfriend, but gunfire broke out and he was fatally shot. Federal authorities arrested 22-year-old Ernesto Gonzo Cisneros, 34-year-old Jesse Contreras, and 29-year-old Luis Alfredo de la Rosa Rios, who are all allegedly members of the Fiorencia 13 or F13 street gang. They also arrested Rios's girlfriend, 18-year-old Haley Marie Grisham, who wasn't a full-fledged member but had connections with the gang dating back to 2021. All four suspects were charged with violent crime in aid of racketeering. Prosecutors described F-13 as a multi-generational street gang that previously has been the subject of federal prosecutions, including two large racketeering cases. The murder happened on the gang's turf in the Fiorencia neighborhood of South Los Angeles. U.S. attorneys accused the defendants of targeting Arroyos because he was wearing gold chains and claimed that the group committed the crime to increase and maintain position within the F-13 gang. It's reportedly not uncommon for young members to carry out these types of crimes in a bid to gain points with their higher-ups. Arroyos' mother, Claudia Membreno, struggled to wrap her mind around the fact that someone took her only child's life away over a $200 piece of jewelry. She later told Fox LA that her son had always dreamed of becoming a police officer and that she tried to talk him out of it because of the dangers, only for him to ironically be killed when he was off duty. Haley Marie Grisham wasn't accused of firing the fatal bullet, but she was nevertheless held accountable for her participation in the crime. She pleaded guilty in exchange for having the death penalty taken off the table, but could still face life in prison. The other three cases are ongoing. Number 10. Tia Maria Jane Landers after losing everything she owned to a series of catastrophic floods that struck Queensland, Australia in 2011, Tia Maria Jane Landers moved to Brisbane to start her life over from scratch. But just three years later, the 28-year-old mother of four vanished. Tia was last seen at a gas station about two weeks before she was reported missing. A month earlier, she'd failed to appear in court for her alleged role in a violent home robbery that she was accused of committing with her boyfriend, Wade Bartz. As a career criminal for much of his adult life, Bartz was no stranger to life behind bars. In fact, he was a member of a notorious jailhouse group of criminals called the Angry Gang. During past prison stints, he'd become infamous for breaking out of penitentiaries, using bolt cutters, having affairs with staff members, and other deviant stunts he pulled to show just how bad he was. So when Tia went missing, it was only natural for authorities to have a heightened concern for her safety and for several reasons. In addition to her relationship with a known violent criminal, the young woman suffered from schizophrenia and relied on antipsychotic medication. Without it, she became mentally unstable. Tia's family was also worried about her, and in a Facebook post, the troubled woman's sister pleaded with Tia to return home and reminded her that she was loved regardless of her past. At the time, the family believed that Tia had run off because she thought it was best for them if she stayed away. But unfortunately, that wasn't the case. 
Several days after Tia was reported missing, her body was found in a shallow grave in a remote area. It was clear, based on her multitude of injuries and a plastic bag around her head, that she'd suffered an excruciating death. The horrific crime was carried out at the home of a drug-dealing couple in their 40s named John Edward Harris and Linda Eileen Appleton. Tia went to the house voluntarily along with two male friends to discuss a potential drug sale. The conversation went south, however, when Appleton accused Tia of stealing jewelry from her in the past. For six grueling hours, Harris and Appleton tormented Tia, forcing her two friends to watch at gunpoint as they hacked her ankles, head, and other parts of her body with knives, a sword, and a machete. The sadistic pair then took Tia into another room and shot her twice in the head. They released her friends and then drove to a state park where they buried her body in the bushland. As it turned out, Tia's gangster boyfriend had nothing to do with her murder. But Bart clearly wasn't the only career criminal she was hanging out with, nor was he the most hardened. Both Harris and Appleton had violent histories, and Harris's track record in particular made Bart's rap sheet seem mild. In fact, this wasn't his first time killing. By the time the couple murdered Tia, Harris already had a manslaughter conviction under his belt for fatally shooting his former roommate back in 1999. He served 10 years for the crime, which bore eerie similarities to Tia's murder. Halfway through their trial, Harris and Appleton decided to plead guilty. They each received a life sentence with a minimum of 27 years for Harris and 23 years for Appleton. For Tia's family, it was a far cry from justice, but no amount of punishment would ever feel fair. Instead, they decided to focus on making sure that Tia was remembered, not for her gruesome death or the wayward lifestyle she got caught up in, but for her kind and fun-loving personality and her passion for life. Number 9. Lenny's Escobar Nicknamed La Diablita, or Little Devil, Lenny's Escobar was the girlfriend of Jeffrey Amador, a high-ranking MS-13 member from Long Island, New York, who went by the moniker Cruel. In 2017, she lured five young men to a park in Central Islip to smoke marijuana. When they arrived, it quickly became clear that they'd walked right into a trap. One of the victims managed to escape by hopping a nearby fence and running for his life, but the other four were ruthlessly hacked and bludgeoned to death by machete, axe, and club-wielding MS-13 members. The killers then dragged the victims' mutilated remains to a more isolated area and stacked the bodies before fleeing the scene. And it wasn't until the next evening that the corpses were discovered. More than a dozen MS-13 members, including Escobar, were federally charged in connection with the horrific crime following an investigation. Detectives theorized that the murdered victims were rival gang members, which their families denied, and that they disrespected MS-13 on social media. Escobar was accused of orchestrating the massacre in a bid to gain brownie points with MS-13. The lone survivor, Elmer Alexander Antigua Ruiz, had posted a photo of himself making the hand signs of MS-13 and a rival gang on social media. Prosecutors told the court that he wasn't a real gang member, but just a teen trying to gain street cred. In the days following the murders, Escobar allegedly bragged to multiple people about her role in the crime. She was also seen disposing of a bloody sweatshirt from the scene and throwing her cell phone out of a car window in an effort to destroy evidence while being followed by police. But this didn't stop investigators from obtaining her cell phone records, which revealed that she told her boyfriend, who wasn't present during the crime, that four individuals took the train and were seeing the light and never coming back. According to prosecutors, this was a coded reference to the murders. Escobar's defense attorney argued that his client didn't know anyone was going to be killed at the park that night. He also claimed that her statement to Amador wasn't a confession, but the pivots of a scared young woman who was in danger. In the end, Escobar was found guilty of all counts, including racketeering and four murder charges. Her sentence was never announced, but the U.S. Department of Justice revealed shortly after her conviction that she'd been spared the death penalty and was looking at life in prison. Number 8. Mercedes Williamson Statistics show that transgender individuals experience staggering levels of violence compared to the cisgender population. A young transgender woman from Alabama named Mercedes Williamson became a victim of this disproportionately high brutality in 2015, 
when she was killed at the hands of her ex-boyfriend. Long before her murder, Williamson had dated 28-year-old Joshua Brandon Vallum, a high-ranking member of the Latin Kings from neighboring Mississippi. Throughout the entire relationship, Vallum kept his girlfriend's transgender status secret from everyone in his life, including his friends, family, and fellow gang members. Williamson knew that her relationship with Vallum was risky, since it was considered homosexual under the gang's bylaws and therefore strictly forbidden. During a conversation with her roommate, the aspiring cosmetologist even acknowledged that both she and Vallum could be killed if the gang discovered that she was biologically male. But the relationship ended without them finding out, and it didn't seem like there was anything to worry about. After eight months of no contact, Vallum reached out to Williamson for a booty call and offered to pick her up. She agreed to it, but became suspicious that she was being set up when Vallum drove her into Mississippi. So, as it turned out, she had every reason to worry. Vallum drove Williamson to his father's property in the town of Loosedale, and before she had a chance to escape, he shocked her with a stun gun, then stabbed and bludgeoned her to death with a knife and a hammer. He covered her body up with some brush, then tossed the murder weapons and the victim's cell phone off a bridge. After Williamson's body was found, investigators were quick to zero in on Fallon as their prime suspect. During questioning, he claimed that he killed Williamson in a panic after discovering during a makeout session that she was transgender, an argument commonly known as the trans panic defense. This was a lie, according to Williamson's roommate, who knew that the former couple had been intimate throughout their relationship. Vallum eventually confessed that he knew Williamson was transgender and that he decided to kill her after one of his friends found out. He also admitted that he killed Williamson because of her transgender status and pleaded guilty to one count of violating the Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Jr. Hate Crimes Prevention Act. It was the first murder of a transgender person to be successfully prosecuted under the act, which was signed into law in 2009. The court sentenced Vallum to 49 years in prison. There's no parole in a federal system, which means he'll have to serve the entire term behind bars. At his sentencing hearing, Vallum plainly admitted to the crime and told the judge that he'd started receiving treatment for bipolar disorder. He sang a suspiciously different tune, though, during a 2017 jailhouse interview with the true crime series Love and Hate Crime, during which he reverted back to his original claim that he didn't know Williamson was transgender until the day he killed her. Fallon said that he lost control and couldn't stop once he started attacking Williamson. Viewers who believe Fallon is guilty were disappointed that he was no longer taking full accountability for his actions, and some might even say that it was a waste of an interview. But the show's director, Ben Steele, told the Daily Beast that the content is there for the viewer to think about and decide whether Vallum has truly come to terms with his own identity as well as his actions. Number 7. Aryan Sisters In August 2007, an Aryan Brotherhood of Texas member named David Mitchamore, or Super Dave, and his girlfriend Christy Rochelle Brown were murdered in the city of Nacogdoches over an outstanding death to a general named Carl Carver. The slaying was apparently carried out by a fellow member named Brent Stalsby under Carver's direct order. This was a fairly standard assignment within the Aryan Brotherhood, which is known for disciplining its disobedient members through threats, murder, robbery, and other violent crimes. The gang has a strict policy that requires lower-ranking members to do as they're told by their superiors. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. Stalsby may have executed the hit, but numerous people were involved in orchestrating the double homicide. His wife, Terry, admitted to being present when Carver issued the direct order to kill the victims. Another Aryan Brotherhood associate named April Flanagan, a known meth addict with an explosive temper, approved of the plan to kill Brown and Mitchamore. She provided Brent Stalsby with the shotgun that was used in the crime and also loaned her vehicle for the purpose of carrying out the murders. Authorities charged Brent Stalsby with one federal count of committing a violent crime in aid of racketeering activity. He eventually pleaded guilty and was sentenced to life in prison for the crime. Terry Stalsby pleaded guilty to accessory after the fact and was sentenced to 13 and a half years behind bars. April Flanagan pleaded guilty to violent crime in aid of racketeering activity, conspiracy to murder and accessory after the fact. 
and as a result, she received a 15-year prison sentence. Number 6. Ricardo Maradin Hailing from the coastal town of Matino in Brazil's Paraná state, Camila Maradin was a fashion model and social media influencer by day, but she allegedly had a much more lucrative gig behind the scenes as the leader of a powerful drug cartel. Authorities initially suspected Camila's husband Ricardo of being the cartel's leader. That all changed though in November 2021, when he was shot dead during the couple's son's birthday party. The party was almost over when someone pulled up in a silver a Volkswagen and mercilessly gunned Ricardo down in cold blood. During police questioning, Camilla denied that Ricardo was involved in the drug trade and chalked his murder up to a case of mistaken identity. Further investigation led detectives to suspect that Camilla had masterminded her husband's assassination. And while they still believed that Ricardo was involved in the drug trade, they accused Camilla of running the cartel alongside her husband. They also believed that she had plans to take the operation over after Ricardo's murder, earning her the nickname of Trafigata, which means pierced in English. Armed with a warrant, law enforcement went to Camilla's house to arrest her, only to discover that she'd gone on the lam. Authorities caught up with her near her mother's house after she allegedly went there to hide a handgun. Camilla and 14 other suspected cartel members were arrested in the case. And in addition to Ricardo's murder, they're accused of killing two policemen named Tiago Cesar Cavallo and Guillerme Antonio da Costa. The cops were killed in the city of Curitiba three days after Ricardo's death. One of the officers knew Ricardo, but it's unclear whether the murders were directly related. Police spokesman Colonel Barroso told the media that the group was already under investigation and the arrests were already planned before the murders. In fact, authorities had been eyeing the suspects for about a year as part of a crime-fighting effort codenamed Operation Ostentation. But once the killings occurred, the arrests became urgent and were carried out sooner than planned. Throughout the investigation, military police discovered payments to Camilla's bank account totaling 1.3 million Brazilian reais. A court froze the account and the group's assets, which included 13 luxury properties valued as high as 3 million reais each. Authorities also seized five luxury cars, more than three dozen weapons, and a large amount of cash. Camilla was freed from custody on an ankle monitor while awaiting the next steps in her case. She and her friend Paolo Sergio Vega were returning home from food shopping one day in May 2022 when someone opened fire on the pair. Vega was hospitalized and Camilla luckily walked away unscathed. They were both incredibly lucky to survive. The shooter, Giovanni Soares, was sentenced to 31 years in prison. During his court proceedings, Camilla claimed that she had no idea why Soares targeted her and Vega. When asked if her husband was a drug dealer, she said she didn't know and that she'd learned a lot of surprising things about Ricardo after his death. Camilla also continued to deny that she ran a cartel, claiming that the lavish life she portrayed on social media was all financed with borrowed money. The case is ongoing, so unfortunately, Camilla has yet to receive her sentencing. Number 5. Genesis Escobar A 21-year-old mother-to-be from Chicago named Genesis Escobar was seven months pregnant when she lost her life to senseless violence in early 2023. Working with several armed accomplices, including the father of her unborn child, the young woman got into someone's car in the city's Belmont Cragen neighborhood and attempted to rob them during a drug deal. The encounter quickly escalated into gunfire between the parties, and Escobar was shot multiple times in broad daylight. Before speeding off, the opposing group dumped the gravely injured expectant mother onto the pavement and covered her with cash, most likely to send a message. And to make matters even more disturbing, Escobar's boyfriend allegedly grabbed a handful of money off the injured young woman and fled the scene, leaving her to die in an intersection. Family friend Iris Alvarez, who lives nearby, told News 4 that Escobar texted her daughter shortly before the botched robbery, pleading for help. But Iris's daughter was sleeping at the time and didn't immediately respond to the messages. A few minutes later, residents found Escobar in the street struggling to breathe. Good Samaritans rushed her to the hospital 
but it was too late to save her or her baby. To Alvarez, it didn't really matter if Escobar played a role in the bungled robbery that was being committed when she was shot. Speaking with News 4, she said that only a heartless individual could shoot another human in cold blood, especially one carrying a child. The investigation into the case is ongoing, and for the time being, the suspects remain at large. Number 4. Tanya Smith Dennis Clem was a member of a white supremacist gang called the Aryan Circle, while his girlfriend Tanya Smith had connections with the Aryan Brotherhood of Texas. The pair met in 2005 and bonded over their shared interest in drugs, tattoos, and racism. That same year, the couple were arrested by federal authorities while crossing over into the U.S. from Mexico with a gun and a large amount of marijuana. Tanya Smith was convicted of possession of marijuana with intent to distribute, while Clem pleaded guilty to being a felon in possession of a firearm. They each served a short prison term and were reunited upon their release. Smith and Clem weren't supposed to associate with one another while on parole, but they saw each other anyway. Even after being warned by her probation officer multiple times to stay away from Clem, Smith continued to see him. In fact, she went a step further and moved in with him at his father's home in Houston while lying about her address to her PO. The couple were still on parole when a gunfight broke out at Clem's residence residence in July of 2007, leaving one of his friends wounded. Clem fired back at the shooter's vehicle, killing two young African-American men. Knowing it was only a matter of time before law enforcement found out about the double homicide, Smith and Clem packed their belongings and hit the road. They embarked on a Bonnie and Clyde-like interstate crime spree that would eventually bring their gang participation in the free world to a screeching halt. After finding the house empty, Clem's cousin called Smith, who instructed her to dispose of the murder weapon and threatened that the same thing would happen to the cousin if she ran her mouth. During subsequent phone calls with his cousin and an uncle, Clem made it abundantly clear that he wasn't going back to prison, stating that he was going to go out in a blaze. A large-scale manhunt ensued, during which the fugitive couple managed to evade law enforcement twice thanks to a police scanner they had with them. At some point, Clem contacted a friend in Louisiana named Alex Brendel and asked for help. Brendel rented the couple a room in the city of Bastrop at a hotel that was conveniently located across the street from the local police department. At the time, Bastrop police were looking to speak with Brendel about an unrelated incident. After learning that he'd rented a room at the motel, detectives headed over there and knocked on the door, unaware that Brendel was harboring two fugitives. The door opened and the detectives entered, but moments later, they ran out of the room as the sound of gunshots rang out. Clem stood in the open doorway and continued to spray the detectives with bullets until they both collapsed to the ground. He then went back into the room and shut the door while Smith fled the scene in a panic. While police and paramedics tended to the fallen detectives, Clem once again emerged from the room, this time with two guns in his hand, and began shooting indiscriminately at the first responder. Officers returned fire, killing Clem at the scene. Both of the detectives he targeted died from their injuries, and two paramedics were injured by gunshots as well. Two days later, a fugitive task force tracked Smith down at a trailer park in Texas, where she was hiding out. When they arrived, she said, you're lucky I didn't know you were coming this time. Smith was charged with two counts of second-degree murder, along with an array of drug and gun-related crimes. She was convicted of all counts and was sentenced to two consecutive life terms in the Louisiana state prison system. Number 3. Tessa Penelver in Great Britain, a high-tech group of criminals known as the Gone in 60 Seconds gang used professional locksmith devices to steal more than 120 cars over a two-year period, starting in 2015. They typically targeted keyless Range Rovers, Mercedes-Benzes, and BMWs that were worth as much as £60,000 each and sold the vehicles on the black market. And to evade suspicion, the gang fled crime scenes in getaway cars that were disguised as hired taxis. The devices, which enabled the gang to reprogram the locks on the stolen vehicles, were obtained by a woman from Essex named Tessa Penelver, who traveled to Bulgaria to pick them up at the urging of her boyfriend, gang member Manjit Sandhu. 
She also laundered over £120,000 of the gang's ill-gotten funds through her personal bank account despite being on low-income public assistance. While investigating the gang's money trail, police realized that Sandu didn't have a bank account, which led them to discover that a suspiciously large amount of funds had traveled through Panolfa's account. She'd also made numerous payments on Sandu's behalf, including to the company that the gang got the lock programming devices from. There was no possible legitimate explanation for the source of the money, and in 2016, authorities charged Penelva, Sandu, and at least five others in connection with the car-stealing operation. Penelva claimed that she didn't know her boyfriend was committing crimes, and accused Sandu of keeping his shady activities a secret from her throughout their relationship. And while her explanation may have held some water in court, it failed to get her off the hook entirely. The defendants were all convicted of various crimes and were collectively sentenced to more than 46 years in prison. Sandu received a 12-year prison sentence for conspiracy to commit burglary and conspiracy to steal. Penelvo was found guilty of perverting the course of justice and transferring criminal property. But because she didn't participate directly in the car thefts, she received the lightest sentence out of all the defendants and was jailed for just 15 months. The judge also based the young woman's sentence on her lack of prior convictions, as well as his belief that Penelvo was naive and acted under the influence of her boyfriend, who was a seasoned criminal. Number 2. Karen Ruiz In a chilling act of violence that was captured on camera, a 31-year-old mother named Karen Ruiz was shot dead in the driveway of a home in Pacoima, California, just days into 2021. The merciless slaying happened during a custody exchange with her daughter's father, 46-year-old Herbert Nixon Flores, who was a member of the notoriously violent MS-13 gang. Surveillance footage showed Ruiz running toward the front door of the house and screaming for help as Flores ran up to her and fired six shots at her. Bystanders could be heard screaming in horror as they witnessed the bloodshed. Flores fled the scene and hightailed it out of California, sparking a large-scale manhunt. And as it turned out, he had a history of domestic violence and had been stalking Ruiz in the months leading up to her murder. LAPD detective Sharon Kim told local station KTLA that Ruiz had filed multiple reports against Flores over a several year period, and shortly before her death, she'd taken out a restraining order against her ex. The FBI tracked him down in Arlington, Texas, where he was hiding out at a relative's home. Armed with a warrant for murder and several other charges, law enforcement waited until he left the residence and then swarmed his car as he drove toward Dallas. Instead of manning up and facing justice for his actions, Flores chose another way out and died at the scene from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Number 1. Jennifer Caridad 24-year-old Jennifer Caridad was last seen leaving her house in Sunnyside, Washington on the evening of August 8, 2021. She told her younger brother Marco that she would be back later, but she never returned home. Marco texted his sister and grew increasingly concerned as the hours passed without any response. The next day, Jennifer's SUV was found abandoned at Bergland Lake in Yakima, roughly 35 miles from her home. Some of the young woman's clothing was found nearby, and there was blood on the vehicle's interior, but Jennifer was nowhere to be seen causing her family to fear the worst. The Caridads told News Nation Now that Jennifer had become completely consumed with her unemployed boyfriend of eight months, 26-year-old Aurelio Escobar. Jennifer's brother Luis said that he wasn't afraid of Escobar, but that he got weird vibes from the young man who moved in with the family earlier that summer. In his own words, Luis said, I didn't want to be involved with him. Shortly after Jennifer's disappearance, the Caridad learned that Escobar was a documented member of the Norteño Street Gang. Law enforcement then launched a search for Jennifer, and in the meantime, Escobar allegedly went on a multi-state crime spree, starting at the site where her deserted SUV was found. He carjacked a man at Bergland Lake, then proceeded to carjack or attempt to carjack several more victims in multiple towns in Washington and Oregon. Three days after Jennifer vanished, Escobar was apprehended in Medford, Oregon, following a shootout with police. He refused to provide any information on Jennifer's whereabouts, and she remained missing for the next nine months. 
Without a body or any direct evidence of foul play on Escobar's behalf, authorities lacked enough evidence to charge him in connection with his girlfriend's disappearance. But they were at least able to hold him in custody on the litany of other charges he faces in various places, including first-degree robbery, first-degree assault, drive-by shooting, and a gun charge stemming from the carjacking at Berglund Lake. In Oregon, he was charged with three counts of attempted murder, eluding unauthorized use of a vehicle, multiple weapon-related counts, reckless endangerment, and reckless driving. Finally, in late May 2022, a farm worker discovered a human skull in Granger, Washington. It was confirmed to belong to Jennifer, marking a step in her devastated family's quest for answers, while at the same time, crushing their hope that she might still be alive. The rest of her body hasn't been found, despite an extensive search of the area. Her cause of death was ruled a homicide, but no charges have been brought forward in the case. Jennifer's mom, Lenore Vargas, told NBC Right Now reporter Jessica Perez that she wished she'd been able to help her daughter. She said she had no doubt that Escobar killed Jennifer and that she hoped her daughter's story would serve as a cautionary tale to other young women about the dangers of staying in an abusive relationship. Jennifer's family couldn't exactly pinpoint what bothered them about Escobar at first, but they found him off-putting. If you lived next door to the known clubhouse of a local motorcycle club, would you be more bothered by the idea that law enforcement most likely spent a lot of time lurking in the area, or by the fact that at some point gang-related violence would most likely break out just yards away from your house? Let us know in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this video, be sure to give it a like and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you in the next one. Bye.